Welcome everybody, both here those in the room and also those that are online this afternoon. Today's debate, and I think more it's a conversation, I think we've debated a lot, we all agree that we can have varying views, but today's debate slash conversation is getting the right mix. The mix between the monetary policy, the fiscal policy, and we've heard a lot about the well-being of, of the nation. And I have the honour of hosting this with three very well acclaimed economists who I know will enlighten us with their views. Um, they may agree and they may agree to disagree. Um, and how we can move, for me, the importance of moving the economy forward. So I'd like to welcome, um, sitting here, directly here, Paul Dazel, and he's a Professor of Economics and the Deputy Director of Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit at Lincoln University. And he has an astounding over 100 refereed publications, books and chapters on economic policy issues, so he knows a lot more than I do. Um, just sitting to his left, we have the wonderful Dr. Eric um, Crampton, who is well known through his columns, his commentary, which appear regularly in New Zealand's major media outlets, and his work with the New Zealand Initiative. And finally, on the far side, Cameron Bagri, who's been actively involved with economics for over 20 years, and is definitely not shying away from any direct approach to discuss trends, challenges, and the issues that affect New Zealand business. So what I did was I contacted the gentleman earlier this week and I said, you know what, I'm gonna give you five minutes and you can go for it. And I think that's gonna be a really start, us to th and, and also our colleagues um, online, to think about the questions we want them to debate. Because this isn't about me asking them the questions, this is about getting their viewpoints, which may help us and may help those policy makers in Wellington come up with the right ways that we can actually get that mix moving forward. So I'm actually um, going to allow us to ask lots of questions. So I'm going to pass over to Eric first, sitting there in the middle, and I'm going to get him to start with his viewpoint. Great. Thanks so much. This is going to be a lot of fun. I really enjoyed uh, John's talk earlier, and I hope that I don't reprise too many of the kinds of themes that he was bringing up. Uh, with the remit as broad as we've had, I usually take it as an opportunity to just talk about whatever the heck I want, and I hope I don't abuse that too much. If we look back over the past year, I'm reminded a lot of an episode of MASH. I think it was a pilot episode. I don't know if MASH really picked up in New Zealand as much as it did uh, in Canada when I was a kid. We saw it all on reruns. Or I was of an age when it was in reruns. In the pilot, there was this great bit where Hawkeye is writing home and talking about the difference in surgery uh, there at the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital where they're having the triage, and back home where they'd be in the doctor's office or in the proper surgery. And he called it meatball surgery. If you spend the time to do the pretty sutures and to do everything right so that you save the patient and you save the leg, the patient on the next gurney dies, right? So they do meatball surgery. You save the patient, you chop off the leg, and you save the next guy too. If we look back a year ago, we were moving into meatball surgery phase. Right now, a year ago, I was terrified that we, well, the response wasn't there yet, and I was really starting to freak out. I'd already done all of my emergency kit, and lockdown was still three weeks away. Um, but policy caught up pretty quick and did some pretty remarkable meat, meatball surgery, if you think about it. The wage subsidy scheme, it's not quite what you'd do if you'd have, like, all the time in the world to think about it. We'd been suggesting modeling it on... Germany's a short time wage scheme where if workers spend a little bit uh, less time at the office, they move to lay on to like an 80% contract rather than 100% in response to the demand shift. Government picks up some of the difference in the wage bill. We thought that might be a little bit cleaner. That's what we've been advocating for. But geez, you cannot fault them for having gotten that kind of work done in a hurry. Fantastic meatball surgery. Getting a border system running, kind of cobbled together, shunting things around so that hotels can be quasi quarantine facilities. Good meatball surgery, bad approach for the long term. And that's sort of the problem that we've got going forward, that we haven't really shifted from meatball surgery to a more business-as-usual approach, setting the kinds of systems that can see us through the longer period. I'm terrified about it for the border system. We are taking too many risks, which means that we're accommodating far too little travel compared to what we could be doing under a better border system. The Ministry of Health seems impervious to any kind of suggestions for improvement, and... In fact, the government seems to just put their fingers in their ears if you suggest anything could be fixed because it implies that something isn't going well. So there's a problem there. 
we didn't shift out of the kind of meatball surgery version of the wage subsidy scheme into something that might withstand future lockdowns. Come August, after the first lockdown, Wellington had turned back to normal business as usual. They were running crazy consultation processes on things that really weren't all that important and did not come up with a better fit for purpose model for repeated weird little lockdowns that we might be getting. And they still didn't improve the border system. Initially, we thought there was going to be mass unemployment. Everybody was thinking the world was going to go to fire. They set up this shovel-ready job scheme, which never really made that much sense. But if the whole object was to avoid mass unemployment, well, maybe they, they didn't reverse course when we saw that the, that the bottom didn't fall out of the labor market, right? Like, it didn't make that much sense to start with. They didn't reverse co course. We're still in that meatball surgery. I wonder, though, whether it hasn't always been thus. There's always been a bit of that meatball approach here. We've got some great underlying institutions, but the day-to-day -day policy that comes out, it's kind of shocking, right? So if we think to the well-being approach, I'm going back to one of the things that I'm supposed to be talking about. This started ages ago. It's not new to this government. There was a way of trying to measure it and evaluate policy for its effectiveness on well-being. The shift to the well-being budgets of the current government and then onwards came with an abandoning of rigor. They stopped measuring effectiveness. When I put in an OIA request to find out whether there was any attempt at frameworks for evaluating the mental health spend in the first big well-being budget, because they said this is, matters a lot for well-being, they hadn't even started thinking about evaluation, right? They just knew that, well, people with mental health issues, they're hurting, so we're going to throw some money at them. That's not a good approach for sound policy. Land use planning. We're seeing a lot of the consequences of it now with COVID. The monetary inflation that we've had has been feeding through into asset prices. It's exacerbating a lot of issues. We keep seeing meatball surgery approaches where we have, well, let's have this one little bolt-on attempt to try and restrict demand despite printing a whole pile of money, and another bolt-on to try and beat councils up for responding to the incentives they face and balking people from building more. We need to rethink the whole system to encourage councils to want to facilitate growth. Zero Carbon Act. Great that we're trying to get towards net zero. It was banning oil and gas in Taranaki anywhere, anything other than meatball surgery, right? It was just a terrible approach. The Productivity Commission had done some work showing that that was the single most productive sector that we'd had, right? It was published in New Zealand Economic Papers recently, and they just turned it off because they got a headline on it when they're going out to an international climate conference. Taking climate change seriously requires better responses than that. It means taking the emissions trading scheme seriously and making sure it can be embedded. But I'll defer to Matt Burgess on that tomorrow. Stay tuned for him. He's awesome. Um, and then the Productivity Commission, sorry, Productivity and the Frontier at the Border. This is the most worrying in the medium term. We have to be able to scale up at the border. We have to get some certainty about what the heck happens once we are all vaccinated or at least have access to vaccines. And a sensible regime, once everybody who wants to be vaccinated can be vaccinated, you just say, anybody who wants to travel into New Zealand and who has been vaccinated can come in. You can't get outbreaks if you've got mass vaccination, right? r naught goes well below one. One person might make it through if they've been vaccinated, but they're not going to cause an outbreak because you don't have a susceptible population. I worry that the approach that we've gotten into that uh, John was talking about earlier is going to be ossified and that we are going to have tremendous harm, not just in the international education sector and in the universities, but more broadly. And I'll shut up. I'm there. Okay, yeah. Start writing down those questions because there was so much in there that we can definitely touch on. Um, so to continue the conversation, I'm going to pass over to Paul to get your insight. Inga tangata e tonei tēnā koutou katoa. Ka tino nui, aku mihi, ki ngā tonga katoa, o Waikato tainui, tangata whenua o tēnei rohi. Ka eti taku mōhio ki te reo Māori, engari kei te mihi a hau ki tēnei tonga o enei mōtu. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ki ora tātou katoa. Ki ora tātou katoa, may you and I, all of us together, enjoy well-being. Uh, it's a great phrase for starting a session on national well-being. Now, in a sense, well-being economics has been with us from the origins of the modern discipline in 1776. But in another sense, the term well-being economics reflects a growing dissatisfaction, including within the profession, with the traditional approach that economists make our best contribution to well-being when we are designing policies that encourage economic growth. And it's not hard to see where some of that dissatisfaction is coming from. 
the statistical data around global climate change, statistical data about the damage that economic activity is doing to our own natural environment, the large numbers of young people, children growing up in households with inadequate economic resources for their personal development, our generation, my generation, is leaving a poor legacy for the next generation. So well-being economics starts with that lived experience of people. And to quote Amartya Sen, it asks the question, what can policy do to expand the capabilities of persons to lead the kinds of lives they value and have reason to value? The answer to Sen's question involves some fundamental principles. Policy design must recognise the fundamental agency of persons, Fano communities for creating well-being. It is not a question of the Productivity Commission delivering well-being to people. Secondly, policy design must recognise the power of market enterprise to greatly expand capabilities of people to create well-being. And thirdly, governments have a unique and distinctive contribution to expanding capabilities for well-being, taking collective choices that individuals are unable to achieve through their own private or market activities. We've seen this during the COVID-19 crisis. The Treasury's fiscal policy and the Reserve Bank's monetary policy have, in my view, undoubtedly saved lives. But there are consequences, as we have heard. Net core crown debt has already doubled, from 60 billion in June 2019 to a forecast of 120 billion in June this year. It will increase by another 60 billion, according to forecasts, over the next two years. Accommodated by monetary policy, this fuels high house prices. The obligation to pay interest on the new debt reduces future fiscal options, adding to the burden that we are passing on to the next generation. At the University of Waikato, it seems safe to say that Aotearoa New Zealand must forge its own pathway through these challenges, bringing together the wisdom from Western science and the wisdom from Mataronga Māori. From Western science, I have great confidence in what economists call endogenous growth theory, for which Paul Romer shared the Nobel Prize in 2018. It emphasises how growth in the discovery and the utilisation of knowledge is the only factor that can sustain growth in living standards. From Mataronga Māori, I have great confidence in what we might call indigenous growth theory, which comes from the whakapapa of tangata whenua to te tao. It emphasises concepts such as kaitiakitanga, whanongatanga, manakitanga and ohanga whairawa. Nga tō rauro, nga tāku rauro, ka ora ai te iwi. Bringing these food baskets together, <coughs> the people will create well-being. Kia ora, tato katoa. Thank you, Paul. And finally, in the corner there, Cameron, over to you. Oh, it's at this moment I suddenly realised I probably should have scribbled out some notes. But what I thought I'd do first, I'm going to talk about monetary policy, fiscal policy, and my take on well-being. And it'll be a little bit of speed dating because I've got five minutes. But what I thought I'd do right up front, because there was a little bit of talk in a couple of the presentations about skills and where we're investing and these sort of things. There's also a big area across the economy we're missing and it's not getting out sufficiently in wider circles. 
Across the Waikato region, 53.6% of students regularly attend school. 20% of students within the Waikato region attend school less than 80% of the time. Now, if I go back to 2015, 70% of New Zealand kids regularly attended school. That number is now down to 57.7. 45% of Māori Pacifica kids regularly attend school. Now, I look at those numbers and I think we've got a goddamn bomb that's about to go off in 10 to 20 years. Now, we're already seeing the side effects of this in regard to attainment levels, in regard to maths and the sciences, and these sort of things. Now, these are some of the issues, some of the topics that, you know, I'd love to see forums such as this get up and shake the hell out of this thing. Um, because there's a whole lot of people here in this audience who are involved in the business community. Well, I've got news for you. You're going to receive an export because that problem is going to get exported into the business community if you don't nip it right in the bud very early on. Where we're seeing the biggest decline in school attendance is not the year 12 and 13 kids that are wagging, it's in primary schools. Monetary policy. Look, hallelujah, monetary policy works. Adrian, the Reserve Bank, they went out there and they did their job. Probably a little bit too well. Uh, inflation, we're starting to see pressures, we're sort of in the zone of full employment. Uh, what we do know now about monetary policy is that we're in danger of testing the Reserve Bank's social licence. Now, people out there, I don't think, do not understand negative interest rates. And it's fair enough, because I think a whole lot of economists don't understand the concept either. But what we are seeing is that you know, monetary policy has had the side effects of driving a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots, and the housing affordability crisis is getting worse. And what that has done is it has forced the government of the day to act. Yeah, what have they done? You know, they've redesigned the Reserve Bank's remit. Now, the Reserve Bank is playing down the impact of that. The word assess implies you don't have to do too much. Well, that remit has now also got government policy involved in it. And I wonder whether that's the the first cab off the rank in regard to where we're going to see more changes. So that's what happens when you get a bit of a disequilibrium in regard to pushing against the, the so-called social conscience. Our fiscal policy, once again, hat tip, it's worked pretty well. Yes, we've got the problems, you know, could have been executed an awful lot better. But with due hindsight, they needed to go big and it's worked. Uh, the big concern I have about fiscal policy at the moment is not the sort of next two to three years, it's the years 2025 to 2025 when the rubber hits the road and we're going to make those hard decisions. And if you want an example of what happens when the rubber hits the road and you need to make some hard decisions, have a look at what's going on across local authorities. Because they are now needing to make those hard decisions so the bun fights are starting. And the central government arena, we've probably got a, a few more years before those hard decisions need to take place. Uh, the projections show we can get government debt down if we crunch capital expenditure and run hellishly tight operational expenditure. Do I think that's realistic? The answer is no. You know, I think we're going to need the, what's been put on the table by the government, and I like it, the independent fiscal institution. You know, I think we're set for bigger government, and that needs appropriate checks and balances on the other side. You know, we've learnt to use fiscal policy as more an economic stabiliser, but we need those checks and balances. Finally, just on wellbeing, it's a, it's a big, complicated framework. You know, my view of wellbeing, or what's going on around the globe, is, is pretty simple. You know, as a central Otago boy, I like to keep things pretty simple. Look, short-termism is out, and long-term game is in. You know, Shareholder-based capitalism has been replaced by stakeholder-based capitalism. You know, the way I think about this is that way back in 1999, I joined the banking sector, and a gentleman back there, Sir John Anderson, taught us Look after your people because the people look after the customer. If the customer looks after, the shareholder is going to get paid. But that was the order one, two, three. Part of the reason the world and New Zealand's got out of whack is that we reversed the order, it became three, two, one. And what's going on at the moment, whether you coin it you know, stakeholder capitalism or the long game versus the short game, is we're going back to the previous order, which was one, two, three. Kiss, keep it simple, sport. Thanks. Thank you. I suppose a good starting point is actually just picking up on, and you all mentioned it, 20 years time. 
I'm a strategist, I'm not an economist. And for me, a thought that I'd like to pose to all three of you to maybe discuss a bit further is, in 20 years' time, some of the audience members here who are students of the University of Wakato or coming in as students are possibly going to be put in your positions to reflect on what has gone and what we should be doing. So if you were thinking 20 years out, what do we need to do now to make sure that this next generation has both schooling and education, has the policies in place by the government to ensure that we thrive, and also we have a market that actually works for us? Go for it, guys. Okay, uh, I'll jump in if nobody else is gonna start. Uh, I think it has to start by actually taking some of the well-being talk seriously. It can't just be mush to get away from standard cost benefit assessment. I think it's been used that way a lot. Uh, we need to have, if, if we take this stuff seriously, we have to be rigorous about it. We can't just use a lot of fancy well-being words and use that to patina over policies that fundamentally cannot deliver what they're supposed to be delivering. If we're gonna take well-being and education seriously and start addressing some of these truancy problems, there's a cargo cult way of dealing with that, and there's a real way of dealing with that. If, imagine if you're a business, and you're giving your product away for free. At the same time, your competitor is a babysitting service that parents have to pay for. And you cannot get people to come in the door for free. What the hell is wrong with your product, right? There's something fundamentally wrong there. Now, we need to be evaluating which schools are able to get hard to reach kids into the classroom, keep them there, and teach them things. It's an evaluation and outcomes-based framework. You start looking to see which schools are doing well. And this, the usual system response is, well, these are low decile communities. What do you expect? We can't do very much with them. They're, they're a hard to reach group. When we were doing our education work, we saw huge differences in performance within the same decile of school. We were in the IDI lab. We were adjusting for everything that you can find in there about the family background of every kid. And you could still see, big differences in performance among schools. Now, most of them are performing fairly similarly, but you could find ones that are doing really well, ones that are doing really poorly. We need to be taking that approach and then letting the ones that aren't doing so well either get taken over by ones that are doing better, learn from ones that are doing better. We need to find ways of getting the good practice that we're starting to identify down through. None of that kind of thing is going on in the Ministry of Ed. They start talking about these community of schools things, but they aren't taking data seriously. They're not doing the kind of evaluation work that we need to start addressing the problem that you were talking about. Similarly in housing, we need to get the systems in place to be able to deliver more housing on a rolling basis so we don't wind up with monetary policy blowing out house prices. That, that's a starter for me. And, Thank you, I'm Paul. And, and 20 years time, that young person, now an adult, is leading a life that they value and have reason to value. They are able to express their creativity in their work and in their leisure. They are able to build families defined very widely. They are living as respected people in a vibrant community whose cultural heritage is prospering. Uh, they are able to be entrepreneurs in the marketplace to create value for customers. And all of this is underpinned by public policy that fosters that creativity, that well-being. And in particular, I think the, the question is, what are we not doing now that we could be doing in 20 years' time? Is recognize, today we recognise that most building and construction is done in the private sector, but the government has a particular role in infrastructure. In 20 years' time, we recognise that most knowledge generation and utilisation is in the private sector, but the government has a particular role in underpinning the creation, dissemination, and utilisation of knowledge, including through the university system, but much more broadly than that. And as a consequence of that, people are expanding their capabilities of well-being because we as a species in this country are developing our capabilities through knowledge generation and utilisation. Thank you. Um, down the end. There's a whole lot of things that need to take place. Uh, you know, I, I agree. You, you got to, data's got to be the epicenter of everything. You know, because you've got the data, it does not mean you're going to get everything right, but you've got a better chance of hitting the right number on the dartboard. You know, so it does need to be 
evidence-based. I still think that short-termism is rife across the government sector. Mm -hmm. There's insufficient long-term planning, and I'll give you an example. When Treasury and the government put out their medium-term projections, they tend to be dictated by some fuzzy working assumptions on operational spend and capital spend. Now, if you think about infrastructure, it's a long-term project. We should have a bit of an idea about what we're going to be spending for the next 10 to 15 years. In the 2018 budget, the fiscal strategy report assumption for capital spend per year beyond the four-year budget process was 10 billion, oh, sorry, 9 billion per year. Yeah, so I think it was moving at 4.5 per cent per year. Yeah, so they were going to spend more than 90 billion over a decade. By the 2019 budget, that had crunched back to about 66 billion. The 2020 budget and the, two th and the December economic and fiscal update, they crunched that back down to 30 billion. Now that just tells me there is no long-term strategy in regard to what we're doing in regard to the infrastructure investment in New Zealand within a medium-term context. Yeah, we've got the next four years pinned down, but we do not have a medium-term framework to start to think about where those needs are. And it's not rocket science. We know what the depreciation is. You have a reasonable assumption about what we're going to see in regard to growth. We've got all those sort of projections. We should have to come up with some credible numbers that you know, have a degree of stickability. And this is one of the reasons I'm really behind the whole idea of having this independent fiscal institution. Fiscal policy is going to play a far bigger role in our lives in the next decade, and we're going to need the checks and balances on it. Oh, excellent. Now, we've actually started a barrage of, um, of um, questions coming in, so I'm going to um, go directly back to there. Um, one for you, Eric, and I'm going to start from the top, is... Um, the Reserve Bank has been part of the government's COVID response. Um, is it possible for it to maintain its political independence given how central it is to this response? I think that depends on the governor. And right now we've got one who talks differently from prior governors and seems to very much share all of the policy preferences of the current government in partisan terms. That itself is a risk to Reserve Bank independence. Would either of the others like to comment on that? Uh, I think certainly within the Monetary Policy Committee there is a huge fear of allowing inflationary expectations to rise again. We, we are old enough to remember the costs of monetary disinflation in the 1980s. I don't think there's any appetite for taking any risks in that space so I retain my confidence in that institution. The independence of the Reserve Bank, the whole framework is intact. You know, it can't challenge that. What we are starting to see, because you know, the social side of the ledger is getting tested, we're starting to see that sort of picking off around the edges. Now, at the moment, it's around the edges. Uh, the risk is that this stuff escalates. Uh, interesting, you know, if, not sure if anybody's read the, the last monetary policy statement. Uh, it's probably only people like me that sort of you know, read through this sort of stuff because I have to. There was a box within the last monetary policy statement from the Reserve Bank that looked at the Maori economy and the structural issues between Maori employment versus the likes of myself. And yeah, you know, that, that, I looked at that and I thought that's a bit of an implicit jab from the Reserve Bank at getting fiscal policy settings right. And I liked it. I find some of that stuff kind of risky, right? Because when the Reserve Bank starts poking the government on things that are outside of the bank's wheelhouse, it makes it easier for the government to come back and mandate things that no, but, well, but, but, should but, have but, been Reserve Bank's job, right? Yeah, but the, the, I guess the... But I agree with you on social license, especially around housing. The, the pressures there are going to become intolerable, and Robertson really needs to make sure that they are able to get housing fixed because of some of this. Yeah, but, but if I have a look at... Yeah, fixing the, some of the structural issues within the labour market in New Zealand, i.e. getting the Maori Pacific unemployment rate actually down, doesn't just benefit wellbeing and all those sort of fancy terms out there. It has real economic benefits in regard to where your equal level of interest rates is going to be going forward. You, know, you reduce the, the, the structural mm -hmm. unemployment rate comes down. You know, so it, it, it's implicitly related to what the Reserve Bank has got. And of course, you, know, you have full employment now within their mandate. So I think they've got every right to be get out there and start looking at those things and good on them. Okay, um, another one, then I'm going to pass over to um, the audience. 
So one for all of you, have we got the overall economic policy mix right or are we too focused on monetary policy to do all the heavy lifting? Well, monetary policy is not doing all the, the heavy lifting. Uh, Grant Robertson, the government, deployed a $63 billion package, of which they've still got $10 billion up their sleeve. Uh, so, so the government's been there, you know, they're joined at the hip. Uh, we can probably argue about whether the mix is right. Now, my personal view is that fiscal policy should be doing more and monetary policy less. Yeah, I worry more about getting some of the structures right, uh, especially around the border in the short term. There are massive opportunities for improving safety within MIQ. You look at opportunities for adopting daily saliva testing under the PCR regime that RACO Science has rolled out. You massively reduce risk. If you massively reduce risk, some facilities start, be, you can start using some facilities that you might not have had a look in at previously. Other things like universities starting to run their own quarantine systems for people who have been vaccinated. You can start thinking about this stuff, right? But every time it's a stone wall from the DG Health on this stuff, I, it almost feels like he knows that two layers down from him, there's just utter incompetence within the Ministry of Health and that letting anything move in that system risks the whole thing tumbling over. So I worry more about some of those systemic structural issues. I worry more about uh, regime uncertainty that's coming in from what the Climate Change Commission is up to. We've got a beautiful emissions trading scheme. They made vast improvements to it last year. They've recognized none of that in the approach that they're taking, and they are inducing massive uncertainty about, like for power, like, for power generation, that we've had a very clean system for that before. They're mucking up all of the incentives in that, where you're not sure whether the government's going to come in and step over the top in investment decisions. It's hard to plan around a system that is just bolting a pile of, pile of things that sound good on top of an ETS that already covers those areas and would work well. I agree. Fiscal and monetary policy has worked together to maintain aggregate demand growth, but the real challenges are on the supply side. So how do we improve education, human capital acquisition to grapple with the uh, implications of the new knowledge economy? How do we incentivize the spread of knowledge throughout the economy from using the assets that we have in tertiary education and crown research institutes and the like. Those sorts of questions are going to make a far bigger difference to our 20 years in the future citizen than fiscal and monetary policy. Which that, that's, that's, oh, can I just add something on that? Yeah, that? Your point in regard to supply is is bang on the mark. Look, you know, COVID is just the ultimate disruptor. And when you get disruptors, you get points of vulnerability become big issues. And what has been one of New Zealand's big points of vulnerability for a long time that we sort of let slip and slip and slip. We've underinvested in key, key people capability. And yeah. now it's coming back to bite us. And another flow on from some of that, it has felt like there's been a very strong xenophobic shift in New Zealand, especially since COVID, that foreigners were kind of tolerated here before. If you look at the surveys, Kiwis are very welcoming to migrate, migration. The policy rhetoric coming into the 2017 election was very poor. It's gotten worse. And I, all of the talk about immigration reset is scaring the heck out of me. They are under the assumption that migrants are taking people's jobs, it's back to the lump of labor stuff. Um, it's not, like if we take some of what Paul was saying about endogenous growth theory, knowledge is often embedded in people, right? And they bring it with them and then they form new networks here and link those networks back to the networks that they had back home and that improves the productivity across the whole shebang, right? But if you start viewing migrants as a cost who are going to be taking your house away from you because we have broken housing settings that won't let people build and you've got a productivity commission that ignores the evidence on migration and says, oh, well, it hurts locals' well-being or something, so we're going to ban people from coming in. It's turning, it, we're, we're getting back towards a fortress New Zealand view of the country, but like with actual walls, right? <laughs> and that's really going to be bad. What I really love is the passion that these three bring to this, and it leads really nicely onto one more question I'm going to take from our viewers, which is actually, what practical steps could the government take to improve how it makes policy to involve the voices and the data that we're actually seeing and hearing here. I know it does take on board what some of our economists say, but it's actually a bigger and a wider problem, as you have alluded to, Eric, with we're bolting on lots of different things to try and solve something, but how do we get a collective voice to help develop these policies? 
I think fundamentally there has to be demand for it among voters. So if we look back under the last government, you started seeing rigor coming in the budget bids from different ministries when they knew that if they submitted a bad budget bid up into the finance minister's office and then cabinet was batting around who was going to get what money, it was ones that had a rigorous cost-benefit assessment attached to them that could demonstrate that they were going to be delivering that which was promised. That built the demand for rigorous approaches for in the ministries, right? So they started staffing up. You started seeing like MB hiring a chief economist. You started seeing these things happening. One of the first things that we heard after the well-being budget was um, analysts in ministries telling us, well, they didn't really worry so much anymore about Treasury's evaluation of their bids because they knew that it didn't matter anymore. One of the conversations we've been having is about uh, human capital in New Zealand's public service, and in particular the need to engage people with qualifications and expertise and strengths to be able to evaluate knowledge and to apply it in a way that is effective. So there is a balance between public participation and export, expert knowledge that at the moment, I think some of our capabilities in our departments in Wellington have fallen in recent years and that there is an opportunity for you know, every, every person in that role is batting for the five million, the team of five million. So the impact of high human capital in the public sector amplifies when it's able to produce good, effective public policy. And we've lost sight of that because we've been trying to cut costs rather than investing in value. I'll put a, I'm going to put a bit of a different mm. lens on some of the stuff and you know, probably a little bit provoking. If you ever look at... 1 plus 1 now equals 11. That no longer equals 2. You, you, we live in a world where disruption, the pace of change is accelerated. And it's not just you know, technology-driven disruption, it's you know, dealing with different people, changes in government policy, mother nature, you know, hailstorms down in Mochuaka during, you know, during the summer, you know, these sort of things. Now we tell the private sector, you need to have a fundamentally different mindset to deal with widespread disruption. Where do we not talk enough about is that the role of government, because government needs to get into that same non-linear mindset. If you look at the, the balance sheet of local authorities is 150 billion. The balance sheet of the New Zealand government is 400 billion. Now the problem, one of the big problems at the moment is that they are not incentivised to take any risk. And not taking risk at the moment is actually one hell of a risky strategy. And the discipline here is that, you know, if something's bad policy and you troll something, you've got to kill it straight away. Yeah. Get rid of it. And this is one of the problems. And Kiwi Bill's a classic example. It's a dog with fleas. Why don't we just put it out of its misery and redirect the money somewhere else? We'd, five years ago, we put up a report that National ended up ignoring. Uh, we were arguing for this kind of an experimental approach, right, where you, it's tough to do. In you've got a unitary state, local local governments, central government doesn't really trust them, right? You look at the U.S. They get 50 different experiments going on all the time, and you start learning what what works, what doesn't work. They feed off each other. You really saw it during Bill Clinton's welfare reforms. We've got no ability to do that here. We we're recommending sort of bespoke devolution following the Manchester model, right? So local councils have something they want to achieve, get some devolved responsibility from central government under contract with a funding line and with accountability metrics around it and then let it roll out to other regions if it proves up in the one area. So it gives some regional flexibility to respect that local locations differ from each other, but also gives you an opportunity to experiment. And like nobody's picked this up, but it, we're imagining things like, well, if migration policy looks pretty tight, and if at the time Dunedin was looking to want a lot more migrants, let them have more migrants. T try out a different version of the RMA that's suitable for urban purposes in Auckland. Try different ways of running the Overseas Investment Act for, for Wellington. See what winds up working. And yeah, experimental approaches, we really need more of it. Which is what business is about. Business is actually focusing, especially small business, 90 plus percent of what's happening in New Zealand is about how we innovate and how we have our entrepreneurial mindset to do things differently, yet we're not actually focusing that from the top down and with our government entities. No, it's almost worse than that, right? So um, 
the, there was a wonderful piece that was put up by a, a friend from the UK about um, differences in mindset in the public sector. So he's contrasting Britain's response to COVID with Britain's response to the Second World War. So the Second World War, Battle of Britain, just go to procurement real fast, get new fighter planes out, you, you get the job done. In COVID, when they were looking at potentially having restrictions at the border, it was like, oh, well, running hotels might be a little bit hard. I guess we're not going to do that. It, just finding the first obstacle as a reason to not try doing something. That is the status quo in Wellington right now. You have to push them to think past the first obstacle and the obvious solutions to the first obstacle. It, they're always looking for reasons to not do anything. I think our audience, has anyone got a question? Because we've really got some some heated discussion here and some real passion behind um, our three panellists. I need to take my glasses off if that's the case. Oh, at the back. Uh, yeah, so uh, John Gibson abusing my position since I spoke <laughs> earlier. Um, Cameron, I don't know so well, but Paul and Eric, uh, well, Paul is an educator, Eric was an educator. The question I have for those two and Cameron, you're, you're welcome to kick in. What, in your opinion, is the reason why the skills which we've equipped, well, I should, the skills which we hope we have equipped graduates with, and I'm thinking particularly of economics graduates, honours graduates, and so forth, you know, as you know, I teach some econometrics, statistical analysis, and so forth, to go to the public sector to use those skills, but something happens and then there's not the opportunity to use the skills, or the skills yes. uh, are not being seen to be used, what is it within the public sector, in, in your opinions, that prevents the creative use of this human capital that we've contributed to um, being used to, to improve public well-being by essentially a rational and rigorous uh, application of, of the human capital? You know, it's pretty tough to teach econometrics in Gauss-Markov, and I sometimes wonder, well, what's the point? Because actually there was no evidence that any of those skills were being used in the last 12 months. Well, I think you've captured it really well. I, I think there are, there are countervailing trends. So the, the previous government has created the position of uh, chief scientists in the government departments, and there is a push for more skills in managing knowledge in a way that feeds into public policy. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a, a move to clear messaging of policy in which the subtleties of sophisticated analysis do not contribute to those clear messages. And, and there has been, uh, I think of, of some departments in particular, a, a move towards simple models rather than to best models. And, uh, and so I share your frustration. I think, that this is my own personal strategy, that if you ask an economist, what is it that contributes to sustained productivity growth? I will say, oh, you are talking about endogenous growth theory for which the Nobel Prize was shared three years ago, and the only thing that can contribute to sustained expansion of living standards is the production and utilisation of knowledge. And in order to produce and utilise knowledge, you need high human capital. And so, if that is accepted, and I think anybody who's an economist, tell me that I'm wrong, because I don't think I am, then any government that signs up to downplaying knowledge within their government department is consigning New Zealand to low productivity growth, low well-being. And once that's accepted, I think the rest will follow. Yeah, there might be a bit of a problem in getting that accepted, though, or even yeah. noticed. Um, a phrase that I had never heard when I lived in Christchurch at the University of Canterbury uh, that I started hearing increasingly after I moved to Wellington was the policy authorizing environment. Uh, that might not be something that's heard in academia. It gets repeatedly pointed to by those who try to take rigorous approaches to policy within their ministries, see that taking that approach would require that their manager takes it up to the secretary, that the secretary takes it up to the minister, and that the minister then has to pick a fight with another minister because it's contrary to less rigorous policy that's coming out of another area. When that happens, it's, a, it's whether that fight is worth it for that minister. 
And if you are in a bad policy authorizing environment, it makes no difference whether you know a whit of economics. Now you can get everything set and ready for when there is a better policy authorizing environment so that when you have a better minister or one that is willing to pick that fight or that fight becomes worth picking, you are ready to go with the answers. So the, what you could be telling your students in that case is when the policy authorizing environment is poor, it is important to set the groundwork for when that ground shifts because it can shift in a hurry and they will want answers fast. There is actually, there's actually been some good stuff that's gone on, but we sort of let ourselves down in regard to execution. I'll give you an example. The Commerce Commission got an additional $30 million in the 2000, and I think it was the 2019 uh, budget. Now, yeah, they, they've got the potential, that gives them a fair bit of muscle in regard to what they can do in regard to looking at competitive pressures across New Zealand. And, and what are we getting? Just, just some real lightweight stuff in regard to what's coming out. Sort of, it's, it's not giving us anything back on the other side, but, but I see across New Zealand at the moment there is a distinct lack of competitive pressures in some key sectors. We all know who they are. And it's, let's light it up. Yeah, and then you wonder whether the answer is the Commerce Commission or whether the answer is changing things at the Overseas Investment Act, getting rid of some of the rules around yeah. buying businesses so that they can be taken over and yeah. get more competitiveness that way, make it easy as hell for IKEA to show up instead of telling them to go away for RMA reasons in 2007-ish, um, making it easier for unbanking kind of services to come in, the things that are happening in the United States that aren't happening here. Yeah. Make it easier for those services to, provide it he to be provided here because we set a low regulatory burden. The regulatory burdens that everybody thinks are here to protect New Zealand consumers, they are protecting us against better things that are happening overseas. Yeah, open banking needs to be accelerated, turbocharged. I've got another question coming from um, Carl down there. Uh, Cameron, you got me a bit excited when you started talking about an entrepreneurial growth mindset and for New Zealand, and I suppose it's similar to the question I asked earlier about diversifying New Zealand's income streams and accelerating it. I'd like to ask you the question, um, what would you do to accelerate and grow the entrepreneurial capability of New Zealand to a point where it could actually be enough substantial billions to actually help us go forward and be less dependent on those primary sectors? The short answer is a whole lot. Uh, something that I'm really hot on at the moment is improving New Zealanders' financial skills, which I think is a sort of subcomponent of this. So if we go back to the global financial crisis, one of the big learnings out of the global financial crisis was that we needed to make the banking system safer because it's a critical part of New Zealand infrastructure. And we did, through various regulatory mechanisms, and that has been a real big source of strength for New Zealand, allowing the Reserve Bank to do partly what they've done via the banking sector helping us out during the recent downturn. What COVID has exposed, apart from some obvious issues in regard to health readiness and these sort of things that we're going to need to think about down the track, I think what COVID has exposed, there is a big portion of the business sector across New Zealand that are just not as what called financially fit. And we're seeing what's called the K-shaped cycle. Some firms on the upward part of the K, and you've got these other firms on the downward side of the K. And part of it is just the basic, basic skill set. If there is ever a time in New Zealand's history where we could possibly get financial literacy or the better term, because financial literacy doesn't connect with kids, you've got to call it something like money mojo, now's the time to get that embedded within the curriculum. Yeah, I'd put a bit of a caution, though. Like, it sounds great. It sounds intuitively obvious. When I looked at this, I think it was about five years ago, the studies in the States were showing that when you put it in the school curriculum, it does nothing to later life outcomes. If you provide the training at the point where they're starting to have to make financial decisions, like if you've got some kind of training module when they're having to think about KiwiSaver portfolios, that might start affecting things. But if you have it well in advance, it, it kind of washes out and it's hard to see the effect. It's also how you teach it. Look, I'm on the board of Life Aid New Zealand, uh, Harold the Giraffe, and we just launched into high schools and we've got a financial literacy thing. Now, we've chosen actors to teach the kids via theatre sports. Why? Because it's different. It's unique. Sure. What are you doing to evaluate the effectiveness over the long term? Well, that's the thing. Uh, 
Good question, because we are getting the feedback from the kids and the teachers. No, but I mean, like, following those kids five years later to see whether, the, like, surely you, you don't have capacity to hit all the schools. You'll be getting more requests than you, than you can yeah. handle. You'll be triaging them somehow, triage them randomly, follow up with the kids who got the treatment, and the ones who didn't, five years later, see if the thing worked. You should be baking that into the outset, right? I'm going to come, I'm come and have a chat to you and you're out to some of your big corporate sponsors in regard to whether we can get, <laughs> <laughs> whether we can get some assistance in regard to that. Because I think that's an outstanding idea that we'd love to be a part of. At the moment, we, we, we test the kids as they go in versus what they know as they yeah, come yeah. out. So we're getting a static sort of answer. But I think that's a great idea. It'd be neat to see what it, whether, they, pay, whether yeah. they switch out of a KiwiSaver default fund to a growth fund when they get first yeah. on the job market, right? And see if it makes any difference. Yeah. If it does, you've done a massive amount of work. If you haven't, then you learn something, right? Yeah, yeah. I like that. But on, on the initial question, Somebody you should be reading is Anton Howes. Uh, he's, a, he's an economic historian who works for the Royal Society, and he's been doing the history of innovation. He's got a big book out now on it where he's looking at the track record of the Royal Society over like hundreds of years and what they were doing to promote in, invention. So he's there talking about inventors and inventiveness. That ties pretty directly into innovation and innovativeness and the inventive mindset. And he talks about the diffusion of an inventive mindset when People get exposed to other people who see problems as something to be solved and overcome for human betterment rather than something just intractable, right? You need exposure to people who also think that way to help shape your own thinking. And he sees that in the history of the diffusion of inventiveness. Now, he'll also talk then about the funnel of inventiveness, where you've got this potential supply of people who've been exposed to an inventive mindset, and then some of them get dissuaded because you've got like stupid red tape barriers, or you've just made it too hard, or you've put in too many other veto players somewhere else in the process. All of those also matter. But getting the top of the funnel right, that matters a lot too. And I think we've forgotten that. We've tre treated innovation and growth as this horrible, bad thing instead of being the fundamental way that we pro progress society and improve well-being. And following on from that thought, the living standards framework is how the government is framing its conversation and policy around well-being. And Treasury are quite open. That we received feedback saying that we needed to address entrepreneurial skills within the framework it's too hard, we've left it to the review in 2022. And as a consequence, it's invisible to people thinking about well-being in the public policy space, and yet, as Eric's just said, it's fundamental. That's what we mean, the creation and utilisation of new knowledge, innovation, entrepreneurial yeah. skill. It really points me to, um, I hope we've got another question down the back, but I'll point into this one first. Um, when children grow up, they're curious. They're very curious. They pull something apart. It's the first thing they generally do. They possibly put it in their mouths as well. But then as they go through the educational system, they're basically put into boxes and constrained. We have economists, we have accountants, we have marketers, we have strategists, um, we have policy makers. We have so many things in the boxes, but innovation crosses and the ability to cross all of those things and, and to bring them together to continue that curious mindset that, to me, is something that we can start now. We can start in our educational... I mean, schools are very good at creating curious mindsets, but we can start with it at work and business as well. We have been generally a nation where it's not good to fail. We, um, our banking system doesn't like investing in failures. It likes investing and in getting a good return. So what could we do to ensure that even though we've got limited return on our investment at the moment, businesses start investing and they recognise there could be failures, but they're curious to build that productivity through that? Yeah, well, 1776, Adam Smith, <laughs> uh, the wealth of nations, specialisation and trade is the beginning of it. And so I don't want to turn everybody into generalists. I, I think there is a, a role in the education system. I, I call it the, the four Ds. It's discover what you are good at, discipline what you are good at, display what you are good at, and recognise the diversity as people make these individual choices. So, yes, we need to build solid platforms, but eventually people specialise, and that's how we build skills and by trading with each other. We, you know, from my food basket, your food basket, the people will be well fed. Uh, but in terms of the, 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 the essence of your question, I, I have a, a lot of respect for the, the capability theory of the firm, which is David Teese, a New Zealand economist working in the United States, that 
the dynamic capabilities created by entrepreneurs in which they sense what will add value to their customers or consumers and sense the technological developments that allow them to achieve that, that's at the heart of it. And it comes back again to what do we know? What do we know about our consumers in Asia? This is Eric's point about we need these connections through our borders. We need Asian people among our community as citizens contributing to connections with our largest, closest markets. And, uh, and I think there are opportunities in New Zealand. We are, we are an open, friendly society that has the ability to recognise what creates value and the skills to bring together resources to deliver and capture some of that value. I challenge a little bit of the initial framing that you'd had. I, I agree with what you've been talking about. Uh, no, no, I <laughs> challenge the framing of the question. I, I, oh, I, I like to <laughs> The initial framing felt a lot like a lot of what I get in Wellington. Like you go to a whole pile of these workshops and you get people who are in policy to work and in productivity work and they wring their hands and they say, well, how can we tell firms how to be more productive, right? Or how, how, how can we make them be more like the more productive firms? And what can we do to force them to be that way, right? It, it's, a, it's kind of got the thing backwards, right? If you set the appropriate enabling environment Firms that are innovative will rise to the top, they'll outcompete the others, they'll attract more customers, they'll get more trade, they'll be able to provide more value, they'll be able to outbid competitors for, for more highly skilled people. They, they will do well. You need to make sure that you've got the right enabling framework, that you don't have barriers to competition, that you don't make it too hard for them to expand by setting up things where like the great big guys can afford these regulatory impositions and they're basically bureaucracies anyway of their own and little guys can never get a startup because we've just made it too hard. You set that framework right, and then the innovation can happen. If you instead set the framework backwards and then see that innovation isn't happening, and then wring your hands in a bloody boardroom in Wellington again about how can we make firms be more productive, and th that just gets it all wrong. Yeah. You used the word, I think, fail at the start. Uh, we no longer talk about failure. We put everybody in a stage which we call deferred achievement. <laughs> which is the, the, the real polite version. But it's actually, it's, I think it's a big issue because what we're doing is we're actually, it's almost like we're de-risking kids too far from the real world. You know, you can't go and climb in a tree or in a swing or, or these sort of things. Now, you, you, my personal, you, you're better off to take a, a few knocks when you're a young nipper or a young kid because it's going to teach you a lesson or two and it's going to make you more resilient when you take those big knocks mm -hmm. when you're older. And what I think we're starting to see is that a lot of people do not have those resilience to take the bigger knocks when they leave school. Because we, we, we're taking risk out of the equation for a lot of these kids. Yes, now down the back. I head over, over the side of here. So the question is, given the rising complexity of policy making, how, what are the implications for the way we train students of economics? And, and the short answer, obviously, is to learn to analyse and cope with complexity and risk. I mean, John Gibson gave us a good example of what that might involve prior to afternoon tea. Uh, I, look, I, I think the complexity is increasing because we are growing as a species and the impact that is having on the environment is creating enormous feedback loop challenges that we have to become more sophisticated or like the dinosaurs it'll be our turn to die out. I mean this is just what it means to live in the natural environment. But I, I have a lot of faith in the creativity of the science community globally to address 
challenges of complexity and risk complexity. Uh, you know, the, the, the sorts of tools we have at our disposal in 2021 compared to 2019, yet alone 1919, is just stunning. And, and so this is what it means as a science community. This is our contribution to well-being, is, is grappling with that sort of issue. I take it a couple of ways. So economists acting as economists shouldn't be making value judgments. They should be emphasizing trade-offs so that people can make their own value judgments and see what the costs are. If I do this thing, then there's this cost over here. Do I view that as being worthwhile or not? Now, that should be intermediated, ideally, through Treasury's cost-benefit framework, where they try to put numbers on all of these things so that you don't wind up getting different weightings on different aspects of it in different policy areas so that you can make the incommensurable commensurable. So training in how CBAC works and in cost-benefit assessment can be pretty helpful in that. But I'd also worry that we are often making policy unnecessarily complicated, that we are trying to load too many things into single policies rather than having each one directed towards a single problem. Rather, and and like, I'll, I'll take concrete example, right? So the Climate Change Commission's report has this big section on uh, native trees versus uh, exotics, right, as part of New Zealand's climate response, and it worries about whether working through the ETS and climate, uh, carbon pricing encourages too much planting of exotics. The Climate Commission should never be worried about that. They should only be worried about meeting the net zero target and making sure that the ETS is robust. If some other part of government thinks that there are biodiversity benefits of having natives as compared to exotics, they should be subsidizing the planting of natives or taxing the planting of exotics, and I don't care which, but it should be outside of the Climate Commission's wheelhouse, right? It's making them adjudicate on somebody else's set of trade-offs, and it's not their job, and it means that they're going to wind up doing a worse job at the thing that they're supposed to be doing and that nobody else is doing. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the big challenges for the economist fraternity is, Chris, keep it simple, sport. Yeah, we've got a real big issue in regard to how we communicate what can be often you know, complex notions and ideas. We've got to break it down so it's accessible for the general public. You know, I really like what the Reserve Bank has done under Adrian in the past you know, couple of years in regard to their communication style. They're trying to make sure that monetary policy is more accessible, more understandable to a wider portion of the public as opposed to a narrow group of financial market analysts. I would definitely agree with that one. Um, I've got just a couple more questions. Um, one from our um, online audience. What can we learn from economic policy offshore, both good and bad? Very little, okay? Um, look, I think... <laughs> I think, uh, and, and John Gibson, I'll return to John, you know, we, we put up other countries' examples and we put up New Zealand's example and we say we're doing very badly. And, and, and Singapore, we won't include that because that's a special case, but, but New Zealand's a special case and every economy is a special case. I think we need an indigenous economic strategy within the public service. Not in the sense of detailing, you do this, you do that, you do the next thing, but accumulating and assessing and opening up for discussion knowledge about our own economic pathway that draws on our assets, the four capitals, but more than that, seven capitals, including knowledge capital, cultural capital, and diplomatic capital, and then looking at how we can coordinate investment in human capital and skills, with investment in technologies, with investment in entrepreneurial effort, in a way that is appropriate for the strengths and weaknesses of a small distance economy on the edge of the Pacific. I think there are important things that we have to learn from abroad. Um, Land use planning is utterly broken here. If you look at Texas, if you want to be horribly depressed tonight, go to Zillow.com. Zillow.com is the American equivalent of homes.co.nz. It's like a pornography for housing, where you can look at other people's houses, you can look at the prices. Take a look, just take a look at the house that you've got now on homes.co.nz, turn it into a US price, 
and look at what you could buy for that value outside of Atlanta or lots of places, right? Uh, maybe not San Francisco. San Francisco is broken. But we can learn things from the places that have gotten housing right. Now, we have to adapt those to make them work here, but they don't have broken incentive systems, right? They yeah. make growth be in the interest of the locality that gets to decide on whether growth will be allowed or not. And we don't do that, right? We've got those things broken. We can look at how Tokyo manages it. If you don't, if you don't like Atlanta, you might like Tokyo. Tokyo gets it right, too. They okay. enable a lot more housing. They're, we can learn from other places. Water, if we find that the gravitational constant in Nepal is one number, we don't have to recreate it here. The gravitational constant is a gravitational constant. Water flows downhill in one place, it's going to flow downhill in another place, and it's weird to think otherwise. New Zealand's embarking on an economic transformation that could potentially make the 1980s and the 1990s look like a walk in the park. And we should not underestimate the degree of structural change that is going to go on across New Zealand in the next sort of 10 to 15 years. Now, fiscal policy is going to have to be a lot more active than what it was during those previous periods in regard to acting as a stabiliser and with the various transitions that are going to take, to take place across New Zealand. We're going to need two things. Look, one, we're going to need to be looking abroad for what other countries have done who have gone through some of the transitions that we are looking at. But secondly, and this is the, the thing that worries me about fiscal policy at the moment, your fiscal policy, broadly speaking, is it's OK fit for purpose in the short term. Yeah, dealing with COVID. We might have a few deployment issues, but it's, it's broadly OK. I do worry about the clear lack of fiscal strategy 10 years out in regard to where we're going. The analogy I use is that when you look at other countries' experiences, it's like putting up the scaffolding. They, that gives you ideas, possibilities, worth exploring, but ultimately the building that you make has to stand according to its own internal coherent structure. And that's what I mean by an indigenous strategy. Something that works because it all fits together in this place. Not because we think it worked there or because it worked there, but because we are confident it'll work here as part of the larger integrated framework that we are building up through our trials and experimentation across the country. I won't disagree with that, but I do think it's really important to show the examples from overseas. Like to give an example, uh, okay, we're a business membership organization, it's the CEs of the main big end of town that are members. Oliver had taken them out on a study tour out to, to Switzerland to show them that local government doesn't have to suck, right? Because everybody's experiences in dealing with, like, maybe it's different here, right, right here in Hamilton, I'm sure you guys have it all right, but other people find that they have big problems when they're trying to deal with their local council. Um, and then finding that it doesn't have to be that way, right? You can have you tried to live in Switzerland? Far out. The red tape by local cantons is just extraordinary. But you, can, you can choose across them, right? And oh. they adapt to things that work better. We're, we're getting fabulous stories out of there of the cantons competing to get investment, the, get new factories there, getting more housing there. Uh, the rail lines that get put through, just fantastic things. You're not going to try and encourage local bodies to compete with each other to attract external investment using ratepayers' funds, Absolutely not, no. Oh. That would be bad. Just checking. <laughs> hey, um, just one more question. We've, we've gone really well with time. So one more question from the audience, and then we'll wrap up. I think over here for the microphone. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I, I wasn't originally going to ask a question, but I see that this is a very brave and solution orientated uh, panel. So um, I'll leverage that opportunity. Just a little bit off the back of that question that I asked uh, to Professor Gibson. Um, and there was a little bit of acknowledgement around it in terms of the disparity between the uh, statistics around uh, Māori unemployment uh, and, um, and, and Pākehā or, or mainstream unemployment. What, what, what are some of the, what are some of the uh, solutions, that was the question that I posed to Professor Gibson, to, to try and close that gap, and I'm, I'm conscious and I acknowledge that you've kind of, you've touched on a few and you've danced around the edges of, of, of a couple of others, mm. but I, I suppose I'd, I'd be quite interested from, uh, particularly from Professor Darzell's perspective, sure. given that you, you, you seem to be a little bit more, um, well, a little bit more understanding in terms of <laughs> Mataranga Māori, so um, perhaps a good place to start and then the rest of the panel. Okay, well, I, look, I don't know much, 
But the work I'm involved with at Lincoln University involves a lot of case studies with Māori land-based enterprises trying to bring together Western science with Māori tradition, the kaitiakitanga responsibilities, supervised by the aunties on the paipai who are saying, this is not right, we're not going to do that, at the same time as saying, how do you construct a global agri-food value chain from the produce of our land into markets into Beijing, Tokyo, California, wherever? And there is some stunningly innovative stuff being done within Māori enterprise mm. to create value for the iwi. And that has been fed through into scholarships for young people to advance their human capital in a way that does not cut the ties from the cultural heritage without which there is no life. So my, my first response is that the treaty settlements have created an economic base that Māori are translating into a platform for dynamic entrepreneurial behaviour that is opening up amazing vistas for Māori globally. And, and so, for example, we did a, a study of consumers of lamb in the UK before and after COVID. And in both of them, New Zealand lamb, Welsh lamb are both thought of very highly, and we asked a question about lamb sourced from Māori farms. And there is a segment, about 60% of a thousand respondents, who were revealing through their choices that they would pay a premium for lamb from Māori farms. And we're exploring further, but it's exactly about trusting kaitiakitanga and what that means for safe food and uh, stewardship of the environment. So that, that coming together of the two cultures within this country, I think, is one of the strengths, the tonga that we heard about earlier this morning, that will drive prosperity for those young people that are going to be 20 years older in 2041. I can't disagree with any of that. Uh, I'd add a, a little bit. When we were looking through that IDI data on school performance, you can see big differences in which schools are able to do a lot more to help kids who are uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds, and that is unfortunately often from Maori backgrounds. And it is too often that poor performance is written off as being something inevitable. Uh, I think that we set too low of expectations of the schools in some of these areas that we need to, we, obviously there has to be the support there, but we can see which ones are already doing a better job and which ones are doing a worse job and making sure that we find out what, what successful schools are doing a little bit better than ones that aren't doing quite as good a job there. We need to have better expectations there. I also wonder about, um, I had talked before about sort of federalist approaches and special economic zones and trying to get um, different policies by region. I also really love the idea of devolution down to iwi rather than to regional councils or to local councils. Like imagine if instead of having to go to council to get your building consent, I, uh, I'm, I still think in Canterbury terms, going to Netahu and saying, well actually can I go to you as my consenting authority and put my land under Maori title instead of uh, regular title and you be the consenting authority instead of the damn council that won't let me do anything. I'll pay some of my rates to you instead. Imagine what starts happening in that kind of a world, right? You get competitive governance and people being able to select into ones that work a little better. It, I, I think there are some neat opportunities in, in playing with that. Now, I'll be data-driven decision-making. Yeah. We've got the information there. You know, use it to drive investment decisions, which do not necessarily have to be monetary-based. They can be social-based, but they have a monetary value down the track as well. Uh, be prepared if the policy is not working, you, you kill it. Redirect yep. the funds into something else that's going to work. We've got to do, I think we've got to be a little bit more ruthless about what we're prepared to do. So we started doing that under the investment approach and then they kind of well, ended. Well, hopefully the, yeah, next speaker might talk a little bit about that. Yeah. This university has an excellent program around Maori achievement in schools. Kotahitanga, the name of it, and it's 
just amazing insights from talking to the teachers, to the students, to the parents, to the whānau, and, uh, and, and translating that knowledge into action across the whole education system, I think, will amplify what you're asking. So I'm really conscious of time because we've been going for an hour 15, which really um, tells us how wonderful these three gentlemen are as speakers. So I would pose one question for you to sum up in, um, and sum up your viewpoints in a couple of sentences. Um, and going back to have we got the right mix, and that is what would good look like for you tomorrow and what do we need to do today? A commitment from the public sector to recognise and implement its distinctive contributions to the creation, dissemination and utilisation of knowledge. If it were tomorrow, what good would... I can do dream thinking, yeah. things that are utterly implausible. Grant Robertson saying that budget bids will be selected on the basis of cost effectiveness and they better be rigorous in bringing their budget bids for the next round. It's probably going to be, it's way too late for that for the coming budget, but for the next one that would have to be in place and that the Ministry of Health will not be the sole gatekeepers of decisions about the border anymore, that there has to be a more, a broader framework, that Treasury has to be back in the mix in helping in decisions, that risk proportionality has to be considered, and that we have to be able to strengthen, take up some of the opportunities that have been presented to the Ministry for improving safety so that we can start rebuilding international connections. Excellent, and finally. Uh, the the macro stuff across New Zealand is actually pretty good, in all honesty. The challenge we've got going forward is it's the fine-tuning of all the little stuff. And if we don't get that fine-tuning of all the little stuff right, then eventually we end up with big problems. And housing is a classic example today. You know, we didn't get there overnight. You know, so you know, we've got to get all the microeconomic things right going forward. You know, macro mm -hmm. was a you know, decades ago story, now it's about those small micro things and it's about getting a whole lot of little things done well that will add up at the end. So I think that's a really good point to, to finish on and um, I think all of the audience here um, as well as myself um, would like to thank the three of you for your wisdom, your debate, your agreement. You're stretching the topic further afield than what we started with to really give us something to think about. I know a number of you are um, going to be staying along, so please continue the conversation um, over dinner for those staying for dinner. So thank you very much. <laughs>